I'd like to welcome you all to the CEH exam prep by Mal2. My name is Randy Kohler and I'll be assisting you with this video lab guide. Overview, just to give you guys an idea of what's going on. The goal of this video course is to help prepare you to successfully take and pass the Certified Ethical Hacker exam. The idea here is to use the video course as a study guide alongside your current study materials that you may have, any kind of background that you may be able to bring into play, and of course, experience that goes along the way as well. Everything in this course will be accurate to what is needed to know to pass the exam. Please pay attention and take notes as you may get questions to many, if not all of the topics that are gonna be covered here. So let's start off. You guys probably heard of the CIA, which stands for the Confidentiality, Integrity, and Availability. And basically what we have is when it comes to conf confidentiality, we have encryption that comes into play. And here, the whole purpose of confidentiality is to keep things private, such as customer data, employee information, and thus. And so we do this through the process of encryption, which we will have a special unit just on that where we talk about the different encryption methods that we can use and what all is involved with that. Then we get into what's called integrity of our CIA. Now the integrity is making sure only authorized users are able to make authorized changes, such as databases and so forth. Now we provide integrity through the use of what's called a hash value or hashes. And we will also talk about this in the section where we talk about password cracking and so forth, as well as in, in the encryption mo module. And we have availability. Which this basically says that we keep the resources available by either backing up, having a continuity plan, and so forth. Now, we generally provide availability through the use of clustering or the use of load balancing and, and such. Of course, also providing redundancy through multiple power supplies, multiple ISP providers possibly, uh, just multiples of everything. Uh, RAID comes into play. Your redundant array of inexpensive or independent disks, depending on what book you've read and so forth. So remember that the CIA stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and how we can provide those. Now, when it comes down to a step to have an effective security program, we basically get into senior management, which generally will go in and accept responsibility. We have a security policy, which is developed. We have procedures, which are written and implemented. And an employee awareness program is developed. We also then have metrics, which are collected, and an improvement process is then implemented. Let's take a look at that some of that in greater details. We need to know about policies. Now, you probably heard of policies. You probably have signed policies when you started with a company, and uh, these would basically be something like your internet acceptable use policies, monitoring policies, password policies, incident response policies, uh, and so forth. So a policy basically will give us an overview of what is expected, what we're allowed to do, what we're not allowed to do, and the consequences thereof. So that way, when the company fires you for some reason, you can't come back and say, well, I didn't know. Well, it said in the internet uh, acceptable use policy that you would not uh, check out adult websites or gambling websites and so forth, and yet you were. And the consequences of that could be up to release of your job, and thus you're out the door kind of thing. Okay, so policies come into play for that. Now, procedures, very simply put, are just step-by-step -step implementations. So if something happens, you pull up the procedure and you check, okay, step one, who do I call? Who do I contact? What do I do? Step two, step three, and you literally just follow it step by step. That's what procedures are generally doing for. So know the difference between a policy and procedure. Now, why this all matters? Now, keep in mind here, when it comes down to it, right, senior management can be held le legally liable for breaches in security, unavailability of the systems, and possibly even disclosure of data client, as in, Disclosure of client data, right? So they have the liability there. Regulatory requirements are also very, very big. You need to know things about regulatory requirements, especially to the PCI compliance. We have also other things like the Gram-Leach-Bliley Act. We have HIPAA, 
which is your Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, and Sarns Baines Oxley Act uh, that we are seeing more and more out there as well. Now, one thing I have noticed out there in the field is that a lot of companies are focusing mainly on are we compliant? If they are compliant, they don't really want to know how many issues they have on their network and so forth. They just want to know, hey, if we're compliant, then that's cool. We can check that off our check mark and we, we're good to go. If we're not compliant, then fix what needs to be fixed so we are compliant so then we don't have to worry about the rest and so forth, right? So more and more companies are going this way, sadly, but that's part of how it is out there. Now, we also have penalties that could come into the financial side up to $290 million, so lots of money out there that could, that could be um, charged as fines and so forth. And, of course, federal prison which I hear is not for everybody. Some of the areas of concerns, right, is employee access to the internet and how they access it and what they access. Employees access to their assigned workstation. Because again, we don't want necessarily users logging on to every single uh, station there or have the ability to do so. And employee access in the corporate network remotely and employees awareness of the organization's assets and how to protect them. Again, this is where your policies come into play uh, and such as well. Okay, now to change things up a little bit, there are different control types we need to be aware of, right? We have the administrative controls. This is basically the management's responsibilities necessary to protect the assets. And we have what's called the soft controls. We also have technical controls. This would be your logical protection mechanisms. Uh, they're generally going to be built into the hardware or the software, right? Like your IDSs, your IPSs, your firewalls, and so forth. And then we have physical controls. Now, physical controls generally will control to protect the facility's perimeter and internal resources. And one major one that is very, very important is um, they, they generally are going to be in concrete. They're going to be... Uh, a couple feet above the ground, and they're called bollards. And the bollards are basically help to protect the buildings or even entryways and so forth from cars, buses, and so forth. And uh, nowadays they actually have them where they uh, come up out of the ground and then they go back down depending on, you know, if it's like a bus route or something only for buses. Uh, the bus comes, the, the bollard will actually go down into the ground, the bus goes across, and then after it's, it's immediately after it goes out, it comes back up. You can YouTube some of this as well. Just um, see some of those things. They're really popular in the UK as well. And um, again, they're called bollards. Now, um, I've seen it as well where uh, they, they use it for not just protecting a particular building and so forth, but also for rerouting traffic and making sure that people can't, you know, just browse through one street to go to the next and so forth. Um, and usually they're in the in the form of big flower pots, as in big concrete flower, flower pots that take up the entire street width uh, and such. So anyhow, do the departments responsible for these uh, different types of security communicate and work well together in your company? Again, that's another big one, too, that a lot of companies are not doing is they're not communicating with each other, which could lead to into lots of different types of attacks, especially on the social engineering side. So here's some of the soft controls. Um, again, this kind of goes back to the policies, procedures, standard guidelines, and so forth. It goes into uh, employee management, testing and drills, right? Making sure, hey, what happens if there is an incident? How are people going to react? Are they going to panic? Or are they going to do it because we're drilling, we're testing, and so forth, right? Risk management analysis. You have to, of course, figure out what you're actually at risk of. Information classification. You should also be taken uh, into, into account. And this basically kind of goes into, you know, how sensitive is the information and are we giving it classification such as internal, private use only? Are we giving it secret, top secret classifications and so forth, right? Are we giving it labels uh, and so forth or whatnot? And, of course, through the process of awareness training. And companies are starting to do more and more of, which is definitely great for getting the social engineering attacks. All right, we have the technical and logical controls. Again, these would be like your firewalls, your IDSs, your intrusion detection systems, encryption, protocols that are being used, uh, authentication mechanisms that, that we're using if we're using Kerberos or, or something like that, auditing and how we're doing the auditing, and also access control technologies. Now, we'll get into all these in a lot more detail here in the up-and-coming modules. 
but just so you know, it's all part of the technical logical controls. And of course, the physical controls, right? Your doors, windows, walls, and so forth. How are they put together? Am I able to go through the door uh, because the door was unlocked or because it had a simple lock on it that we were able to you know, bypass fairly easily? Security guards and dogs uh, might also be part of that physical control. Fencing and lighting, as in how tall your fence is and what is your uh, fence actually protecting, right? So we're we putting barbed wire up there and so forth. Right? And of course, lighting is also very important. Locks. Right? Again, we're talking different types of locks, too, and there's lots of ways we can go about uh, bypassing some of that, and I'll be demonstrating some of that here in, in the up-and-coming modules as well. Environmental controls, again, this also, uh, like your HVAC uh, stuff, making sure that the server room doesn't have too much humidity and so forth and, and things like that. And, of course, your intrusion detection systems um, as well, and these could be cameras, um, things of that nature. Uh, as well. Of course, I just mentioned the, the bollards, uh, which are going to be coming out of the ground in the UK, or they'll be um, basically your, your concrete posts um, that will be in front of a building, so that way there's no, you know, no car can easily drive into the building uh, because they're protected by bollards. Okay, so now when we look at um, the evolving threat, there's definitely some things here we need to know. Now keep in mind, as we continue on with the modules, I'm not going to be referencing what you need to know because everything we're talking about in this course, you need to know. So how you remember it, um, again, making notes and hopefully uh, with some of the the scenarios from your prior experience and uh, any kind of studying you've done so far, all this will work really well together and it'll start making a whole lot of sense, hopefully. All right. So anyways, when we're talking about the evolving threat, there's different types of uh, folks out there. Now we have, uh, of course, the script kitty and so forth we start out with, which basically does it for curiosity, personal fame, uh, and so forth. The next up is going to be the thieves. These are going to be your hobbyist hackers uh, and so forth. They generally would do it for personal gain uh, a lot of times, uh, maybe for the money uh, and so forth. However, when it comes down to it, the spies um, are going to have the largest segment by dollars spent on defense, and uh, they have, might have national interest in mind uh, and so forth, right? So we have lots of different uh, types of threats out there. Now, other terminologies that we may come across, um, we also have what's called the hacktivist. Now, the hacktivists, these are going to be kind of more specialists and so forth. Um, and basically, the hacktivist would be doing something for a cause. Now, the hacktivist is uh, someone that um, maybe has a passion for saving the trees. So what they will do is maybe hack into a company that is cutting down trees and uh, to prevent them from cutting down trees or something like that. That would be considered a hacktivist. And uh, they would generally do it for some agenda. Now, we also have uh, another one called the suicide hacker. Now, the suicide hacker very simply is, just as it sounds, it's, it's someone who doesn't care about getting caught and going to jail for a very long time. So rather that jail time be five years, 30 years, or whatever the case, they don't care. They just want to get it done, and uh, they don't care what the results are. Um, and they're called suicide hackers. Now, other terms here that kind of go along with this is what's... What, what we call the white hat hacker. And the white hat hacker is basically someone works on the defensive side and helping to protect your uh, systems and environments and so forth. So in essence, it's a hacker that does the defensive side. And uh, they're also called penetration testers or security analysts. Now on the other spectrum is the black hat hacker. And the black hat hacker is someone who does it for offensive purposes. And uh, they don't really care about, um, you know, the rules of the trade and so forth. And we'll have another slide on this as well where we differentiate between the black and white hat. Then we have the gray hat hacker who mainly uses the defensive side, but on occasion will also get onto the offensive side. All right, now when we look at the security vulnerability life cycle, basically what happens is you have a vendor that ships the product out. The users of the product generally will find some kind of flaw, some kind of error, some kind of you know, something that's not working and hey, lo and behold, it's a vulnerability that they've discovered. Now what happens is then that the vendors uh, get a hold of this and they make modifications to those components. And then with that, they come up with a patch. Patch is basically released. Then the patch would be deployed at the customer site. 
Now, Microsoft kind of does this through the use of the automatic updates. Other vendors uh, tend to do also with automatic updates and so forth and checking every day and to see if there's a new update available and so on. Um, but back in the day, they used to have it where hmm, the only way to get it to the customer was one, either via email, which was actually the secondary thing. First way to do it is to uh, put it up on a site and then email the customer and say, hey, we have an update available. Make sure you download and install it. It fixes some security vulnerability, right? And uh, back in the day, people weren't doing it. So what ended up happening was attacks were occurring between the time the patch was released and before the patch was deployed at the customer site. And uh, again, the, the time frame initially was actually pretty large. Uh, we had um, uh, literally over a year uh, initially, but what, what was happening was uh, the the black hat hackers and such, they were checking out the websites that had the patches released, and they would download the patch and reverse engineer it, and then come up with a exploit tool that would then exploit the vulnerability that's supposed to be patched, and thus they were able to do some of that. Now, the exploit time uh, line here, as I mentioned uh, here, uh, almost well, almost a year for NIMDA, 331 days between the patch where the patch was already out and by the time it was exploited, it took 331 days for NIMDA to be created. SQL Slammer, 180 days, right there, six months. The Welchia Nachi, uh, 151 days. Blaster, 25 days. Now it's to the point where we have two hours or less for a patch to be reverse engineered. And as this cycle keeps getting shorter, patching is a less effective defense in large organization. And mainly to the fact that a lot of organizations have customized applications that are running on the inside through their intranet and whatnot. And whenever they have an update for IE or for Java or whatnot, it causes the application to not function properly or not to be accessed properly. So a lot of organizations are stuck, yes, stuck at older versions of IE and older versions of Java and older versions of whatever else that they're using to connect to these applications. And um, these need to be, of course, test and tried, um, have a little beta groups and whatnot, a little group of people within the organization that will test it to verify all is well. And if so, then put that, that particular patch on the whitelist and then disperse it out to the rest of the organization. If it causes issues, then the alternative there would be to have one, uh, of course, to keep it at the uh, older version or to update the application. However, when you update the application, it causes a lot of development time, right, from the developers and so forth. And that could cost the organization lots of money. So they may justify, hey, it's going to cost us a million dollars to update this app to the next version of Java. Um, however, if we keep it the same, we actually get to keep that million. So the logic would be, yeah, we, we just, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix the kind of thing. And if we don't have to put a patch on it, we'll just, we just won't. And that's generally what happens a lot of times out there. All right, so what happens is uh, we basically get vulnerability assessments and penetration tests that are getting done. And what this basically this allows us to do is intelligently manage our vulnerabilities. So any vulnerabilities that are found during vulnerability assessment, right, we can do a penetration test to see if we're actually vulnerable to attacks through those vulnerabilities uh, by exploiting those. Right? It also avoids the cost of network downtime. And a lot of times, you're able to meet regulatory requirements and avoid fines, like your PCI compliant if you're using some type of credit card online transactions and so forth. It also preserves the corporate image and customer loyalty. Very important, right? You don't want to lose your customers. It also justifies the security investments and satisfies prerequisites for cybersecurity insurance. Definitely a good way to go. And a lot of companies, they're required to at least once a year do have a pen test being done. And I believe there's something just recently that's been passed that um, it requires companies to do it on an ongoing basis, not just once a year anymore. So uh, definitely something to look into. There's different types of penetration testing. Black box testing assumes no prior knowledge of the infrastructure uh, to be tested. So the testers must first determine the location and the extent of the systems before commencing their analysis. Right, the black box testing is also useful in cases where the tester assumes the role of an outside hacker 
then tries to intrude into system without adequate knowledge of the system. At the other end of the spectrum here is white box testing. So white box testing provides the tester with complete knowledge of the infrastructure to be tested, often including network diagrams, source code, and IP addressing information. This also will assume the role of an inside threat, also known as the insider, also known as the disgruntled employee. All right, very important. And there's also several variations between, which are often known as gray box testing. Now, uh, again, the black box testing would be a black hat hacker type thing. Right, so we only have one piece of information a lot of times, which is either a name, a phone number, a uh, URL, you know, uh, a uh, domain name for the target and so forth. In the white box, we generally will have even username and passwords for domain admins, uh, things like that. All right. Other things uh, to remember is hacking methodology. There's five phases and the phases need to be known in order. We have what's called reconnaissance. This is basically where we go in and we intelligently work off obtaining information either passively or actively. And passively, we mean by sniffing traffic, by eavesdropping, by looking over someone's shoulder, right? Actively, where we here are mentioning Aaron and who is databases, which we'll talk about later when we talk about DNS and such, uh, examining website HTML code and social engineering. And um, Anyway, we'll, we'll have a whole module on reconnaissance and information gathering, footprinting, also known as, and it's definitely a, an interesting and one of my favorite topics. Then we get into scanning, second phase. This is identifying systems that are running on, the serv running on and the services active on them. We can do ping sweeps and port scans and so forth. There are gonna, definitely going to be um, port numbers we need to know about, and um, we'll... we'll hit those a few times throughout the uh, the course here so make sure you have your port numbers down and what the services there are running on those the important thing about knowing port numbers is that when you look at a port scan using nmap your network mapper um, you can identify if it's a windows machine if it's a linux machine if it's a printer uh, and things like that all because of what ports are open on those machines or on those devices so it's going to be very important um, that you know your port numbers I would hate to have you go through the exam and get to a port number such as, let's say, what's the port number for Kerberos, and it is actually port 88, and uh, it's used to authenticate users who are using and password when they log on to a domain uh, environment. And it, I hate to have you miss a question similar to that, all because you didn't know that Kerberos runs on port 88, HTTP runs on port 80, SMTP runs on port 25, and uh, those could be easy questions that you can answer um, if you happen to just know those port numbers. And again, there will be uh, roughly two dozen or so port numbers you need to remember and memorize. All right, now scanning side there too, again, second phase. Um, and uh, we're going to be talking a lot about Nmap and the, the different switches and so forth. So my recommendation here is you get yourself more familiarized with Nmap. Uh, I'll be showing you a, a lot of these things too that we're talking about. So I'll be showing you different Nmap scans so you can see it. And uh, if you have the ability, try it out on your own as well. Um, see what different uh, switches do what and what the output looks like and things like that. All right. Also, the third phase is called the gaining access phase, also known as the enumeration phase. This is where we exploit identifiable vulnerabilities to gain unauthorized access. We a lot of times can do this through exploiting a buffer overflow or brute forcing a password and logging onto the system. And uh, again, this is um, also one we're gonna have a chapter on all by itself, and, and it's gonna be called the enumeration uh, chapter. And mainly here we're talking about null sessions and how to construct a null sessions and how that all works and, uh, and what kind of things we can enumerate from that. Enumeration basically means is that we gain access through um, to a remote machine um, through means of uh, like a null session type scenario. And again, we'll take a look into that and see what that looks like. All right, maintaining access is the fourth. There's uploading malicious software to ensure re-entry is possible. Here we do this by installing Trojan horses that implement a backdoor on the system, for instance. So we'll talk about Trojan horses, rootkits, things of that nature. Um, and then we also uh, mentioned things like um, steganography and, and uh, things like that too, um, to be able to also kind of help cover our tracks when it comes down to that. So that's the fifth 
hacky phase, so steganography fifth pack. Um, you can carry out activities to hide one's malicious activities. We could do this by deleting or modifying data in system and application logs. And we'll talk about this again in the hacking Windows module, where we will uh, talk about uh, password cracking uh, techniques and so forth. We'll mention rainbow tables and things like that. We'll also uh, talk about um, hiding uh, files such as with uh, ADS, your alternate data streams and so forth. I'll show you guys what that looks like. Uh, steganography would be another and uh, and things like that. So rootkits uh, has its own little section there as well. But all that is coming into play when it comes down to that. So know the five phases in order. Reconnaissance, scanning, gaining access, also known enumeration, maintaining access, and covering our tracks. So methodology for pen testing. Basically, we start off with footprinting. Right? We, we want to gather as much information, publicly available uh, information as possible. And uh, we can basically get this through uh, ARIN, uh, INNA, uh, various websites and tools and so forth, um, and, uh, and whatnot. Well, again, we'll have a whole section just on that. Again, the scanning portion, enumeration. We just talked about this, right? And then here we get into what's called the penetration uh, side. Um, now, if the penetration fails, what generally will happen is we do a denial service. And a lot of times this will happen in a uh, if it's in the malicious intent. So if the penetration fails for the uh, malicious hacker, for instance, they'll do a denial service attack possibly. And uh, they basically say, hey, all else fails. And, and um, it's basically used as the last resort. So you did a good job on a security system. And generally, an unskilled hacker will stop there. Um, but a lot of times, um, the denial service will then take the approach of, hey, if I can't have it, nobody can have it kind of thing, right? Now, in a real pen test, however, um, unless authorized to do so, you will not be doing a denial service attack if the penetration fails. All right, just to keep that in mind there. <laughs> if the penetration is successful, right, then we can go in and possibly do things like elevation of privileges, the manipulation of data, right, covering our tracks and things like that. Right, so uh, anyway, good stuff. All right, and of course, leave back doors. Um, and again, these could be your root kits using tools like Netcat, which we'll be talking about as well, and uh, knowing, having to know some things about on that. All right, and then some of the penetration testing methodologies that you need to know about. Um, one is called the OSTEM, also known as the Open Source Security Testing Methodology Manual. It can be found at the isacom.org slash research slash OSTEM.html uh, site. And uh, it will definitely assist you um, in how to do a pen test properly. Uh, it takes you through the step-by-steps and so forth. Uh, I would highly recommend that you check it out and at least glance over it uh, at a bare minimum and uh, kind of get a feel of what the OSTEM is uh, and so forth. NIST, National Institute of, Nas of Standards and Technologies. Um, this is going to be coming off of the SP 800-115, which is the Guide on Information Security Testing, which can be found at the csrc.nist.gov slash publications slash pubsps.html. Again, also highly recommend you at least take a peek at that. Then we have the FFIEC, which is your Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council, Information Technology Examination. And uh, it has an IT handbook that you can check out at the uh, ithandbook.ffiec.gov slash it-booklets slash information-security.aspx and look for the information security booklet. Again, check it out. There are a couple hundred pages there, so uh, unless you really like reading and you want to cover it out, you can. Um, but for exam purposes, um, just browse through and uh, kind of get a general idea of what it, what it is and, and what it's able to do there. All right. Uh, the Information System Security Assessment Framework, uh, ISSAF. This is by the Open Information System Security Group. You can check that out at the OISSG.org website. All right, so let's take a real quick peek at the hacker versus a penetration tester. Now, the hacker here, too, um, would be considered the, the black hat hacker. Our, and uh, the penetration tester here would be the white hat hacker, also known as the security analyst, right? So when it comes down to it, um, there's no code or ethics, ethics motivated by greed, cause, or fame, depending on what type of hacker it is, right? We talked about the different types. Um, and uh, the important ones we need to remember here um, are going to be um, the one 
uh, like the script kitties, uh, the suicide hackers, right? And of course, then your black hat hackers um, and such. So depending on what their what their cause of is to do that. Now, the penetration tester here obviously it will follow a strict code of ethics. The hacker will gain illegal entry um, as an unauthorized entry, where the penetration tester has to have legal entry, must have authorization in writing even, right? Will try any technique without regards to loss. And uh, again, they don't care if the server goes down and they lose data. However, the pen tester is defined to a set of boundaries, which is defined before the pen test even starts. Black Hat tries to bypass logging. Penetration tester needs to log and record all the activities. No report share or possibly shares exploits unless they're zero-day exploits. And the zero-day exploits are going to be exploits where there's no patch available. And uh, a lot of times they will not share those. However, they may have the inkling of sharing those exploits after all. Who knows? You know, but a lot of times they will share those zero-day exploits to themselves. Um, the pen tester here presents a detailed report of the test. The hacker will exploit vulnerabilities where the pen tester will try to correct those vulnerabilities. Of course, the hacker is the black hat bad guy and the good guy white hat is going to be the penetration tester slash security analyst. All right, so to kind of wrap us up on this intro is to look into things like not just the tools, right? You need to be able to do other things, be creative. And uh, I usually refer to this as thinking outside the box, right? So you want to think outside the box. You want to be dynamic and also have a good thorough understanding of the technology and tools that you are using out there. Because keep in mind, tools will only get you so far out there and uh, it's all great to say, hey, I got this tool that does everything for me. However, it is a good idea to be able to do some things manually to verify because the tools, as I've seen in in the field, it, they don't necessarily do 100% of a good job all the time. Um, example would be something like Saint, and it's a Linux-only tool for vulnerability assessment and penetration testing, and I've actually used it in the field where we got really good results on the vulnerability assessment side, but then when we used the penetration testing side of Saint, um, it came back with not so good results. And once we went in and manually verified we were able to get in a whole lot more machines than what it found uh, through the penetration testing on the on the tool side. So I'd highly recommend that you, yes, you can use tools, but I highly recommend that you actually go out there and test it out. Try it manually through different ways, methods, um, to see if you can actually penetrate um, some of the vulnerabilities, you know, exploit those vulnerabilities type of thing. So... All right. Now, what we're going to be uh, doing here next is we're going to get into some of the information gathering side, the reconnaissance footprinting side of things. And I'll be showing you guys some demos and uh, show you guys how things are supposed to be looking and where we go and so forth. Again, keep in mind, everything in this course is is designed to keep you on track specifically for the CEH exam. So make sure that you keep a hold of every little piece of information I give you um, because it may be pertinent to your uh, passing with a good score um, at the end. So uh, keep in mind, uh, you may not want to just use the video for your studies. Um, keep in mind, I'll be referencing uh, different things, websites, and uh, again, encouraging you all to go out there, try things out as we go through this as well. And hopefully you have the, you, hopefully you have the ability to do so. And again, that will just reinforce what we're talking about here. It's a, a great way to do it. And uh, again, I've uh, just to let you guys know, I've, um, you know, been doing the CEH for a very long time and uh, I've, you know, focused on, you know, usually bigger classes, uh, 20 to 25 students. And out of those, I usually have a 98% pass rate, um, meaning that only one or two students may not pass as they go through uh, my classes on these um that's mainly due to the fact that they didn't study at home and so forth. So it is required for you to take some study time uh, after watching the videos, maybe doing a little research and verifying some of the information for your own sake um, and just kind of reinforcing it. Because again, the the likelihood of you remembering something just by hearing it is only 10%, right? So what we're trying to do here is get your senses involved. The more senses, the more you're going to remember. 
So not only will you hear things, you're going to see things, and then hopefully you have the opportunity to do things as well. And here we're getting in you know, different senses that will help reinforce and help you also remember uh, the information uh, that's being covered. All right, there's a lot of good stuff, and uh, as we continue on, I'll uh, throw some sample questions out there, but keep in mind, everything I'm talking about, you should be able to answer any questions regarding these topics, and uh, again, we'll give you some samples of that as we continue on. So let's go ahead and hop into the next section. Thank you very much, and we'll see you here in a moment.